you almost never upset me. That's so I like have most people that. would be upset by the things if you said to them. Oh what yeah. You say to me, but it doesn't upset me because I view you as being on a different planet. Because you just tune me out. It's just like it's like it's like I just you know throw spaghetti at you, but it just bounces right back off. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I listen, but I'm not... You're a heretic. <laughs> yeah, like when someone like calls me a heretic, I just like... Tweet Why don't we go back to Namby Pamby land? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Guy can come out. That's us. That's us right there. You know, oh, hey, lady, you need a tissue? <laughs> oh, watch the throwing of the air. All right, uh, so the, can I do my rebuttal? Yeah, please. Okay, here's all i got to say about this. I read your thing and I said, listen, here's the story on shrinks, right? Therapists. Yeah. What they do is what they stick you in a box. Yeah. You walk in like within like two sessions, they've completely figured you out, right? That's what they, you know. And by the way, if you go to like ten shrinks like I have, you get figured out ten different ways. That's why the whole thing is a crock. It's not a science. It's it, 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 every one of them has. It's like an art, and each one of you, each one of them paints you a different way into a different box, and then you have to like, okay, I'm in this box. Then once they have this box figured out then anything that you say that doesn't fit into their box for how they've created you, they'll dismiss because it doesn't fit their box. So basically what they've done is, here's you, right, with like, here's you, you're like all these different things, you're a complex creature, and they take like one part of you that's here, and they throw away everything that doesn't fit that box. So they dismiss all the normal parts of you, and you're not necessarily lying or wrong, it just doesn't fit how they've defined you, right? So I would not call that, oh, they know you so well. I would say that they're so incompetent and they're so arrogant, arrogant, because they're from New York, and they're so ego-driven and ego egotistical, and they think that they know it all, and therefore they dismiss everything on the side. So I would just say, look, you know, when a, when a therapist says, hey, that doesn't fit the rest of the model, you say, hey, you know, maybe the model needs to be widened, maybe you need to open up your box. That's why I don't go to shrinks. What percentage of shrinks would you say like that? How do I know? No, what would you guess? I, from I your can say experience. this. All of them. <laughs> from my experience, all of them. I've been I've been in the offices of twelve different uh, mental mental health professionals. Uh, all of them fit this description. Every single one of them tries to put you in a box. That's what they do. That's their first. That's their first <coughs> obsession when you walk in is I need to get this guy into a box, okay? And they railroad you into believing anything they create in their little scam as long as you keep paying them, right? You pay them, they create this box, and you just keep paying and paying and paying, right? And that's why I said, you know, the five minutes of, I used five minutes of, of important time, you used five minutes of your money yet. Okay, these people, these scam artists, these crooks, should not be compared to Joseph Chasvashalom, who knew Paro was lying. How did he know that Paro was lying? Because he had Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is like God presents to him the picture. God says, here, Yosef, I'm going to show you what this guy's dream was. And Pharaoh is telling Yosef a information that's not consistent with what God has revealed in front of Yosef's face. Because Yosef sees the, the dream. No shrink has Ruach HaKodesh. Your turn. Okay. So, do you think your life has been improved in any way by the shrinks you've seen? I mean, you may have, like, no. off yourself if you hadn't seen a no. shrink at no. some point. No, 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 not at all. I've got nothing good to say about that profession. And by the way, I can say this because I, once again, have a degree in psychology, and I was actually uh, registered for classes, accepted and registered at Pepperdine University for grad school. I was going to be get an MFCC. We talked about this before, right? And um, the more I, 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 just whatever. I know it's a scam. So one of the characteristics of a leader, someone that I respect, is they don't only tell you things that you want to hear. So Joseph, like, gave her like when I tell you these things. Exactly, that's why I respect you so much. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, Genesis chapter 42, verse 1. Uh, Jacob tells his sons, you know, go to Egypt, get food, so that we may live and not die. So why the, like, repeti repetition of live and not die? Because in ancient Hebrew thought, severe poverty is like death. So there's nothing in 4,000 years of Judaism that says poverty is good. The poverty is good is a Christian perspective. We don't have that in Judaism. 
Now, the, public, the poor may be righteous, the poor may deserve our, our charity and all that, but there's nothing in Judaism that says being poor is a good thing. Can I, can I rebuttal? Yeah. That is absolutely false. Everything you just said is absolutely fictitional and false. It's patently false. You said in ancient Hebrew thought, severe poverty is like death. Nothing in Judaism, nothing in Judaism says poverty is good. That's a Christian perspective. The Talmud says in Baba Basra 13 that when one gives money to a poor person, it is not considered a gift. Why? Because that money rightfully belonged to the recipient all along. God gives a person money. He gives them $100. It's a test because that money belongs to the ani. It belongs to the poor person. We're going to test this other person to see if they give it to Rabs. Rabs is poor. Rabs is asking for money. If you have $100, Torah tells you to give it to Rabs if you have the money to give. Okay, that's the test. So Rabs being poor is not death. It's not, a, uh, it's not bad. It's good. Because that money is mine. God gives somebody else the, to, the money to start with, and it's supposed to end up with me. Okay? So it's not like being poor is bad. It's just a point in time until the people who were supposed to give that person the money give it to them. That's what it says in Baba Basra 13. Uh, poor people and beggars actually do a huge uh, service for society because they provide... Uh, an opportunity for those with money to perform a mitzvah of giving tzedakah. Without poor people such as me, rich people such as you, lady, <laughs> would, and, and, and whoever's watching on YouTube, our 36 hardcore viewers on YouTube, uh, uh, I, give, I give them an opportunity to do the mitzvah of tzedakah. If not for people like me, you could not do tzedakah. So it's not a bad thing to be poor, it's a good thing because I'm, I'm doing that. That's a tr and I'm giving this people a tremendous uh, spiritual benefit. Thus, outside of cer certain circumstances, like when a person you know begs when they shouldn't because they have money, being poor and begging is neither wrong nor demeaning. That totally is not true. Judaism says it's a very honorable thing to beg and to be poor and to accept tzedakah. Quite the opposite. We see that doing so is meritorious, according to Torah, because in giving other people a chance to do a mitzvah uh, and gain spiritually from it. Now, maybe according to Christianity, nothing in Judaism says poverty is good, but Judaism says the opposite. Okay, then. So, why did Joseph get in touch with Jacob, his father, Yaakov, let him know he was okay? Why did he name his first son, Joseph named his first son, and says this, you know, this child's making me forget my childhood? You want me to give you the answer? Yeah. Okay. Now, those are great questions, by the way. Those are really legitimate questions. Uh, the Ramban explains, oh, I'm going to do them one at a time. Sure. So why didn't Joseph get in touch with Jacob? He was in, how, he was in uh, Egypt for how many years? Uh, 20. No, he ruled for 80 years, but how... Uh, he was there for a certain amount of time. Uh, he explains that Joseph, Rambam explains that Joseph understood that his dreams were actually prophecies. They weren't just dreams, they were prophecies. So when God revealed to Joseph that two different dreams, one was that his brothers would bow down to him, and the other one was that there would be 13 that bowed down to him. Right? It was like the, right? The 13th was his father. So the 13th came, that dream came second. The first dream that came was the one with just the brothers. So he had to wait until his brothers, he wanted to fulfill both of these dreams and in order because he believed that these were prophecies from God and they had to be delivered and performed in order. Okay? This is a massive responsibility that Joseph has. He wanted to see his father very badly. He wanted to embrace his dad. He hadn't seen him in years. But he wanted because he had a tremendous responsibility. He had to tell over these prophecies or make them happen in order. And the first one is the brothers have to bow down to him. So the first thing that has to do is he has to wait for the brothers to show up. Finally, they showed up. They all bowed down to him. And then he said, go get my father. And why did he name his first son for making him forget his childhood? Ah, that's another great question. But I have a bigger question. Yeah. Why did, would he give him a Hebrew name? The name is Menashe, right? Yeah. 